I'm Barbara Sherwood Lawler. I am a volunteer chair of the Science at Massey program here at Massey College and a senior fellow. And in my day job, I'm an earth science professor here at the University of Toronto in research and teaching, uh, working on the water and carbon cycle, both from near surface remediation of drinking water and all the way down to looking at very, very deep ancient water that held some of the secrets to understanding deep life on our planet. Normally, I try to do introductions off the cuff without referring to a piece of paper because I had a really good teacher about not doing that. Um, but today, uh, these, there's just too much. So I'm actually going to refer to a piece of paper to do these introductions. Peter Martin is known to many, many of you as Peter has been a stalwart in our community, a senior fellow at Massey College, Rosemary's dad, which I think he's most proud of. Um, but also, in terms of his research, one of the leading theoretical astrophysicists in Canada and in the world. Peter works on inter interstellar material, gas and dust in the near vacuum between stars. And over the years, he has done this, working not only on data and interpretation, but also data generated from the Herschel Space Observatory and the Planck Survey. And he's looking forward very much to the kinds of information that we'll receive from the Space Web Telescope. Uh, he's been here at U of T since 1972, following his PhD at Cambridge. And uh, as we know, we'll have many interesting things to say, I think, not only about science, but uh, across the full spectrum of what we're talking about here today, space, science, and the intersection with society. Dr. Juna Colmile, again, as we, uh, if you were here earlier, you heard her introduction, also a Massey Senior Fellow and Director of the Canadian CETA which we probably didn't define, but will for those who don't know what CETA is. It's the Canadian Institute for Theoretical Astrophysics. As mentioned, she's the director of the Sloan Digital Sky Survey and works, as you've seen, understanding the very origin of our universe, material, formation of the galaxies and black holes, etc. cetera. Uh, did her bachelor's work from California Institute of Technology and a PhD from the astronom in astronomy from the Ohio State University. And as we mentioned earlier, uh, also an enormous work at the uh, Carnegie Observatories. And is the 2002 Solvay International Chair in Physics. The Right Honorable Julie Palayette also needs absolutely no introduction to this crowd, uh, being a ex-junior fellow. One is never an ex-junior fellow. A junior fellow, having been chair of the Lionel Massey Fund, which as I understand it from all the junior fellows, that's your social money, right? That's the social club? Okay. So an ex-chair of the Lionel Massey Fund is a junior fellow, long-standing alumni, senior fellow, and this year uh, volunteering and contributing uh, with our great gratitude and thanks to the Science and Massey program. Julie, of course, is uh, astronaut, engineer, scientific broadcaster, and uh, corporate director. Flew two missions in space after degrees from McGill and the University of Toronto itself. Uh, in um, computer science and mechanical engineering. Oh, God, no. No? <laughs> I got it wrong. I knew I got it wrong. All right, you correct me. It doesn't matter. It's because uh, if you know an in anything, any engineers in the room? Oh, I will be I'm next week. Because I'm, I'm surrounded <laughs> with really brilliant minds here. I'm an I'm a double E, an electrical engineer. Electrical engineer. engineer. A Apologies. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> But you know I'm terrible for that. I always get it wrong. When I'm at schools in the States, I, I always get it, the wrong so football. Okay. I always get the wrong football, <laughs> right? Well, yeah, but I'm trying to promote U of T engineering. So it's That's important good. to say. We like that. <laughs> anyway. Astronaut, two missions in space, then working in particular, and I think this will be very relevant today, uh, worked as a scholar at the Woodrow Wilson Institute in Washington, D.C., particularly investigating and talking about the importance of human space exploration in the context of geopolitics and society. So I think I'll have a lot to say about that. Obviously, several years in politics as well, and uh, we're just really, really grateful to have all three of you here to help us drive this forward. Merci. Merci. Thank you very much. I wanted to start this by just going along the panel and asking you, in the context of your thinking about the role here today and Juna's talk earlier, what's the driving issue that you're really thinking about in the context of these big questions of space, science, and society? And we'll sort of start there and just try to see if we can get this moving organically. Peter? Yeah. Oh, you're pointing at me. I'm pointing at you. Okay. Well, I thought I would start off lightly. 
I brought my umbrella. <laughs> and uh, I was involved for years working on the Planck satellite. And, and the, the best thing that was produced by the Planck satellite <laughs> was the inside of this umbrella. <laughs> because when you're in a heavy rainstorm, how comforting is it to be able to look up at the Milky Way as observed by the Planck satellite? So this is deeply inspirational and useful. So never think that uh, basic science isn't useful. <laughs> Wonderful. So, but what do I think about? Well, Judah mentioned that we've got this trajectory towards 2060. And there's decades in between that. And I won't be around. Uh, but I think about, you know, how are we going to get through that? And I often find myself uh, being or feeling like an alien looking down at the Earth. And it could be, well, it could be like uh, someone when you're standing in the kitchen waiting for the pot to boil to maybe throw in the lobster or something. To, or you're lighting a campfire and you're just trying to get the uh, tinder to flare up and get that campfire. And the humans in my vision uh, as an alien are either the lobster <laughs> who's going to get boiled when it comes to a boil, if it does, or the marshmallow. It's going to get nice and toasted. And I, I worry about that. We should all worry about that because this is a very precious planet and we're not absolutely in control of it, are we? Or maybe we're too much of it in control of it. So there's a lot of risks that we can identify. I've been reading a book by my mentor, uh, Martin Rees. He's got a new one coming out. He's got lots of great ones in the past, too. And uh, one of his points is one I resonate with. There's, we've got all this science. We've got all of this technology. And it's not, uh, it's not all trickling down equally to all of humanity across the earth. So there's a huge gap between what could be enabled by the science and technology and what is being experienced by most of humanity. Now, uh, people in this room are not most of humanity. We're very privileged. But we have to be aware of the rest of humanity and how they are, I'll pick a word, uh, downtrodden, sometimes deliberately, but even if not deliberately, uh, not enjoying the world as we do. And so I think that is a big responsibility for all of us who have the agency to maybe change things so that the world uh, will be better. You, you heard the phrase after the pandemic, build back better, but that's that's almost become a cliche. Uh, but we all know the world could be better for all of us. But we, there's this big gap. I think it's an ethical one. It's not a technological one uh, that we have to uh, jump across in order to uh, make sure that in 2060, uh, the world is the beautiful world that, that could be rather than the disaster it could all also be. And that, that really is the challenge. Uh, as I said, I'm not going to be here in 2060, but uh, I've been educating people uh, for 50 years now at the U of T. And my basic goal has been to, because I enjoy that so much, and, and researching our field is so terrific. It's always a Galileo moment every day, and it's a candy shop or you know whatever the analogy is. And my my biggest thrill is 
if I can get my students uh, to come along with me on this journey. And I want to be able to ensure that uh, they have the same kind of delight and fun uh, in the future that I've been able to enjoy. And it's not at all guaranteed. And the more you think about it, <laughs> the less guaranteed it is. I think we know what the risks are, uh, but the biggest risk is maybe, is maybe a meta risk uh, that, that we don't know how to get to grips with the risks and uh, get on top of this. And so we drift along and, and drift along. I was telling uh, Juna uh, the other day that uh, I stumbled across that uh, Keller in 1959 had written about CO2 in the atmosphere and warming and so on. And then Jim Hansen told us about it more in the 80s. And then there was Kyoto. And now there's COP, COP, N, N, N. And uh, we have to figure out in our, our school, or one of the challenges is, uh, what, what difference can we make? Because clearly for decades in the past, as many decades in the past as we have looking forward to 2060, uh, we have to make better progress than we have in the past. Uh, so I'll, I'll leave it at that. Maybe we can discuss collectively how do we make that progress. It's a really big challenge. So I, I see each of these different risks that, uh, that Peter just described and even the ones that I articulated as mm -hmm. things that we actually have are the capacity uh, as humans to solve uh, as challenging as they are. And I think, uh, and I, I see uh, the thing that I most worry about is the seemingly total breakdown of the social contract. Uh, and I think we've lost touch. And, and as Peter said, I think this, is, this, this really resonates with what, with what he was describing. We have ethical um, amnesia at some level in terms of uh, understanding what we owe one another, what we owe the future, what we owe uh, each other. Um, and I think, to my mind, it's that breakdown in our uh, agreements with one another that we are in this together that, uh, and certainly uh, in, our, in our political leadership where we would hope that uh, cooler heads would uh, prevail, we saw certainly um, in my home country, um, you know, we managed to politicize a virus. That's rough. Um, that's a rough uh, because I think I think there was a lot of hope, uh, or at least um, I had some hope that okay, this is a this is a unifying moment where we can actually come together uh, as a society. And the absolute opposite happened. And I think that uh, I think that there that breakdown in our commitment to each other that we are in a society together and that we're better together um, uh, is 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 something that is leading to uh, we we just can't even tackle these risks about uh, our handling our environment and of course the risk that I see uh, as very close uh, and just devastating is uh, is the is the nuclear threat. Uh, this is something that it's going to be hard to engineer our way out of. Um, uh, we might come up with floating cities. Uh, we might, you know, rely on our colleagues in architecture and electrical engineering and mechanical engineering finally <laughs> working together uh, to, uh, to, uh, to, 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 to have a future. But it's really this idea that, you know, it, be on my team or perish. And I think that that thinking is anathema to uh, a successful and self-actualized civilization. And I think that it is, uh, given our capabilities as a species, it is, uh, it is so totally destructive. Um, 
that that we have to we have to really get some leadership in place that can um, that can that can actually bring people together because we can't continue this trajectory is just going faster and faster into a very very painful wall and I think that's what I worry most about Julie first of all thank you uh, everyone uh, for being here at uh, at this forum thank you Barbara for inviting me I'm so delighted to be with Peter again and to meet you June uh, it's interesting, I, I, I'm a very pragmatic person. Uh, I've done a very operational job all my life. So I'm uh, surrounded with, uh, with a lot more thinking than I think I've ever done. And, uh, but yesterday, yesterday I was uh, working, uh, Quebec's having provincial elections and we were doing the, uh, the, the preview vote uh, the last two days and I was working and uh, there was somebody working with me at the, ta at the voting table and she, at one point in time, I wanted to say something about uh, how, uh, how uh, science and society, because she's asking me about this and that, is, 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 cannot be dissociated. Everything we do has some roots in science and every scientist's work has a root in what society is interested in and what they look for. Uh, we're, we're curious species period over and done. We're curious in all kinds of ways. We're curious in developing a new art form or in getting a new painting or or if you're a baby, if there's a door open, you put the baby down, the baby's going to go straight for the door because it's innate in us that we want to know what we don't know. So I was explaining all this and at one point in time she, she was listening politely and she said, uh, have you done uh, your numerology? I think she would have asked me if I had read my astrology that morning, I would have felt about the same because I'm like, a, I'm not so sure what it is, but now I'm intrigued, so I'm going to go look it up. But uh, I think it has to do with you do some numbers and then they figure out what numbers suit you and those numbers will tell you about your personality or something like that. And I was then thinking, wow. Uh, this is so different than a question I would ask anybody because it is to me something that is a bit pseudoscience, non proven thinking. What it is, though, it is that there is a gap. And this gap is when you're saying, let's get together. Well, as long as that gap, the, the gap in education, the gap in resources, the gap in just even access to basic food, my, my phone is ringing, so I'm going to just turn it off. <laughs> Technology is, is, is enormous, and it's always been like that. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't think as a species we've, we've ever been fair completely throughout this planet. There, there's been haves and have not all along. That doesn't mean that we should continue like that, but that's what it is. And that uh, it is very interesting to to start looking at what can we do to encourage people to look at the evidence before they make decisions or, or believe into something. I mean, this lady yesterday absolutely believed that I had special numbers that would apply to me and that if I knew them, I'd be better off. And I, I, I can't, I don't laugh at this, but I know I don't and I don't really care about having a special number, really, but she does. And uh, how do you bring that, that dichotomy? Uh, when you were, you were talking about your example of you go into a cocktail party, uh, Jun says that uh, y y you know, if you say you're bad at math, it's OK. But if you say you can't read, it's a bit embarrassing. I use the music for that. I, I say, if you're at a cocktail party and the fifth Beethoven is playing, and you say, uh, to -to -to what is that? And people say, well, you know, the person doesn't know much. But but if you say, I, I don't care about math, that's OK. That dichotomy is what I'm very interested in. I think that uh, we all have the capacity. We all have the actual knowledge in our day-to-day -day lives to bring those two together. Uh, and there's, there's got to be a bit more effort, even at the very academic level. Um, I was looking, U of Toronto has a, um, 
science and society minor in the humanities, social, social science program, and it's part of history and philosophy department. And they're talking about science and society, how society influences science and how science influences society in return. And I think that is where uh, part of, uh, of uh, the awareness of what's going on lies. There is very little, I, I think there's very few, if any, scientists that do not think this planet is getting warmer. I, I, I don't think anybody disputes that, but there's a lot of people who, who still do out there. And uh, if you look at the evidence, you can only get to one conclusion, just like Galileo. And I'll stop there. I tell the story often, not because people don't know they do, but I say, think about him. He paid a dear price for saying that the that the Earth was probably not the center of the universe because there were things that were turning around another planet that was not the Earth. He was excommunicated, he, he died uh, forgotten in his home, and still we talk about him 400 years later about the Eureka, Eureka moment. What he saw is undeniable. You would have seen the same thing in 1610 and you would have said, oh, something is turning around something else than us, and therefore we can't be the center of it all, period. And that we all have the capacity to do. Access to the education is the start. Thank you. I'm sort of pseudo moderator part panelist here, so I'm just gonna try to pull something together from that. And what I've observed that I hope speaks to what you're all talking about, which are these huge challenges facing us. Um, over all of these aspects of society, but, but with an underlying core of the equity issue. You know, how do we work this together such that we move forward? One of the things that struck me is that th the language we use and the way we choose to visualize things really matters, the narrative we put around things. And even as scientists, I've noticed that we are constantly exhorting our students, certainly on midterms, compare and contrast. <laughs> and I've thought about that language in a bit, and I've thought even that can lead us into some big issues. We don't realize how loaded language can be. If we talked about integrating rather than the compare and contrast aspects, because for instance, and I'll just give you an example of one of the things that I thought might come up. I often get asked, you know, as an earth scientist and you care about the earth, why do you waste your time with NASA? you know, looking outside the earth if you care about this earth. But I think it's pretty obvious from talking to people here that that is a false dichotomy. And, and there's two ways of pointing to it. One is, is, you know, I always point to the famous interview that uh, the head of NASA gave during a few years back, one of the administrations in the States, and this could happen anywhere, but this particular administration was challenging NASA for the funding it was putting into earth science observatories, taking a look at flooding patterns. You know, why would NASA be investing in that? And was this a false use of money? And I thought it was a brilliant, um, the NASA administrator at the time brilliantly simply said to Congress, if my launch pads at Cape Kennedy are gonna be under a meter and a half of water, I'd like to know about it. Which I thought was a very practical way of arguing for why <laughs> NASA invests in understanding all planets, not just the ones out there, this one too. But the other example I'll give is that that, that I think challenges this idea that uh, these things are, are, are orthogonal. I, I remember the very first time I was asked to serve on a NASA panel. It was the Committee on the Origin and Evolution of Life. And this was way, way back at a time when evolution was disappearing from most funding initiatives in the US. And I remember saying to them, how are you able to retain the E word <laughs> in the name of your committee. And the answer back again from somebody at NASA was, we're very proud of the E word. So I guess what I'm trying to say is there's a technical reason why investigating space and astrobiology and some of the more esoteric things I do are deeply integrated to understanding and protecting this planet. But there's also, I think, a power in 
I'm going to say science, but, but anybody who's studying something, in some ways your choice of what you study and the, the passion with which you articulate it gives you the ability to perhaps protect an idea. And so NASA not only, to my mind, and, and CSA and, and space agencies around the world, not only protect this broader picture of what we need to do to protect all planets, including our very precious one, but they also really embody this narrative component that's able to connect with other human beings and thereby give them the mandate to protect an idea that uh, might are otherwise be challenged. To challenge yes, other? absolutely. That's why we're here. Because I agree, when it comes to pragmatic argument, well, you know, if I get flooded, I want to know ahead of time. And, uh, you know, we have a real estate developer in the room, a friend of mine, and I, you want to know, right, if you're going to develop something that's going to cost $100 million, that you're not on a place that in 20 years from now is going to be uh, underwater. But then scientists, especially when you're working in a field that is le lesser known or has not produced something, immediately concrete is why are you wasting this money? Why are you wasting money trying to find 100 million galaxies? You know, we know there are galaxies now, okay. so one more. What, what is it going to bring us? <laughs> exactly. No, I think uh, the utility of useless knowledge, right? I'm a theorist. I mean, I, I mean, come on, like, really, there's got to be. I mean, I, I like to think that I'm just being kept up the streets. You know, I could be messing with the financial markets. Like, I'm good where I am. Uh, the physicists in the finance they can do a lot of damage. Um, but I think, I, I think that that's absolutely right. There's a preserving curiosity, preserving just these very basic tenets of what it means to be human and what, you know, if we're just feeding ourselves and living, right, just satisfying Maslow's lowest rung of the ladder, is that what our aspirations are as a society? Is that what we want for every citizen? Is that what every citizen wants for themselves and their children and their friends and their, you know, the people they like? Um, forget about the people they don't like, right? But at the leadership level, it's like you need to try to guarantee that for everybody. And when we're talking about these gaps, um, we, I think it's really important that we're honest about why things exist, like why these gaps are there and what is making them. So, you know, Peter, you mentioned the downtrodden and sometimes that's, that's you know, intentional and sometimes that's not. Um, and you mentioned the astrologer that I'm asked if I'm, you know, uh, I'm asked when I say I'm an astronomer or an astrophysicist, people often, you know, present their palm to me. And, and I, I... It's interesting because me, they think I'm an astronomer, which definitely I'm not, which I'm sorry. <laughs> and and they, they think astronauts are astronomers and astrophysicists. Right, right. We get the weirdest question about black holes and pulsars. I just well, fly spacecraft. <laughs> <laughs> well, so, you know, so, the, so where I go with that is, um, you know, what is, what is that? I, I like to think that people are trying to understand their world. And it's very easy. Um, and I remember as a kid um, looking at, I didn't have a family that was, uh, you know, that were lots of professors. I, uh, you know, was the uh, first PhD in my family, um, first uh, my, me and my siblings and I were the first to go to college. Uh, so, uh, so I know these astrology types uh, and I love them. Uh, and, and, and it's a way of organizing the world that is really easy, okay? So you got the zodiacs, you got the 12 things, and then you have a way to understand things that are happening to you in your life that, and to, to, to put a narrative to that when life is chaotic. And now what I do when life gets chaotic is I, you know, go, I code up some simulation or I go and I do some calculations. Like that's how I am Laundry. getting my order, <laughs> right? It's right. Order. It's a, you know, we're all fighting the second law of thermodynamics in some way. And I think it's really important that as, as, um, you know, as I, I think as scientists, I think it's really important that we, um, if we're really serious about bringing everybody along, um, I think we also have to understand that different, different, different things serve different purposes in people's, in people's lives. So if you want to walk off the edge of a building and think some other force, then gravity is going to 
protect you, I mean, best of luck with that experiment, but we know how it's going to go. Um, if, you, if you want to um, gather with your family and celebrate traditions, and, or if you want to you know, kind of have, have fun and organize your world in, in another way, um, you know, I, 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 think, I think that's okay. But I think, it's, I think that it, it can't be that this gap is a gap of ignorance. That, you know, there's a gap of choice. You know, you can say, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna read your tarot cards now for fun or whatever it is, but it can't be because I have been denied this other world for whatever reason. And, and it's funny that you mentioned about the fair. My, my older son has concluded, he just turned 12 and he's concluded that fair is not a concept. So he's going around telling, fair is not a thing, there's not fair, like it's, he's really struggling with this fair concept. And so you learn, pretty quickly that actually life is not fair as much as we try to, uh, you know, what we're trying to do, I think as a society, is move towards a more fair and just and equitable world where people's potential, whatever it is, is liberated. Not that, look, I mean, if you've seen my paintings, I'm not a Picasso. I've got very little potential in that dimension. Okay, fine. I do other things, <laughs> right? Hopefully, okay. Uh, Peter, you were about to say something. Uh, isn't that yeah. education also as, as a way? It, uh, and I mean education not in a, in a big way, just like access to yeah. information. And how, how do you teach critical thinking? It's something that's fascinating. How do you teach critical thinking to everyone? And everyone is capable. I was going to pick up on Julie's uh, point about why one more galaxy and so on. Maybe I'll, maybe I'll, <laughs> I got him there. Oh boy. maybe I'll, t I'll tilt it to, you know, why one more planet? It's pretty exciting to see all those planets out there. When we started CETA, uh, we, we had a conference about disks and jets firing out from uh, newborn stars. And the hypothesis was there was spinning gas around those uh, stars and the obvious follow-on from that was that, well, if you had the technology, you'd see some planets form there. But we didn't have the technology. But in 20 more years, we did. And so now we have them all, and people are pretty excited about that. So not just astronomers, but the, the general population, I believe, although it, it, it's hard to put yourself in somebody's shoes coming from you know where we work. So let's, let's connect that to the hierarchy of needs. I, I, you but before, you go, before you go on, do you really want an answer to the question of more galaxies? Because I do have a very good answer to that question. I, <laughs> I thought it, it was rhetorical. Uh, no, I'd love to hear it, but it, it's yeah, of okay. course what we get. No, I'd like, I really yeah. do, because I think we all do. But, but, but it is, the, the, the f they ask the question all the time. I get that question all the time, but I'll tell you the corollary question I get as well. They want to know why we're wasting money sending people to space, but they want to know if I saw anybody when I was up there. Yeah, both. <laughs> both yeah. So a hierarchy of needs it's might so be exactly where we need to look at it. Hierarchy um, of needs. Okay. I, well, I don't know. For, for humanity, it's kind of constraining with most of humanity d trapped down here and know, maybe get to the next level. So I, I like to think that maybe something of what we're doing in trying to understand if there's other planets, other life habitability and so on, uh, could actually turn that pyramid on its head. Uh, and well, if gravity operated in this pyramid, everybody would fall to the bottom. But you know, the, the highest level of that pyramid is uh, you know, so, some uh, appreciation of some bigger thing and how we connect to it and, and so on. I don't think you actually need to go through all of the hierarchy to get there. People can actually appreciate, you know, be right up there uh, through the things that we can present to them. And it doesn't have to be artificial and related to astrology or anything. It's all rooted in facts. You can see it yourself. And uh, 
and you can see where the pitfalls are. I mean, I'm as excited as anything to see if the rovers on Mars are going to turn up anything that signified any kind of life form having developed, even if it's dead now, uh, in the earlier phases of a wetter Mars. Boy, that would be just fantastic breakthrough. That would be the Galileo moment of that year. Uh, of all time. And, uh, and I would hope that that would be uplifting to people uh, in all walks of life and in all parts of the hierarchy and maybe boost them, if not forever, but up, you know, way up there on the uh, hierarchy. And uh, that kind of levitation is maybe what we need in order for people to feel like they're part of some big thing uh, that's worth looking after, instead of the mundane things of getting to the next level, which, which is important, especially if you're at the bottom and you don't know where you're shelter is coming from and where your meal is coming from. That's, that's really important. But somehow we've got to, I don't know, levitate people up quickly uh, uh, so that they're all, they all come along in this community, this whole global community that we have. So why one galaxy? Yeah, so, so, so two, two answers here. So one, in terms of why more galaxies, so when we actually, so I like, I have the phrase uh, 10x or die. So if you, and Galileo had it too, so like he's, he's pretty good. <laughs> so, you know, when we go to these thresholds in order, thresholds in orders of magnitude more galaxies, we learn fundamentally different things about the universe. So we learned from Stickman, you know, going from, sort of a hundred galaxies to a thousand galaxies, that stick man that I showed you, we learned like, okay, the galaxies are not uniformly distributed and that led us into dark matter. Then when we went from a thousand galaxies all the way up to a million galaxies, we learned about, you know, more about dark matter. We also learned about dark energy. We learned about all of these other things. When we go to this next threshold, we're hoping to really probe these inflationary conditions. So when people say, oh, there's all these theorists with these ideas, but we can't probe it, so forget it. Well, that just is a statement about our current state of uh, ability to probe things. That's not a statement about the information access. So if we don't probe those thresholds, we just leave uh, knowledge about the nature of the universe and the nature, you know, of reality on the table. Now you're like, well, I still don't care. And I know some people who, and that oh, is I usually, <laughs> yeah, no, no. But I mean, I know a good friend of mine who, uh, who I love dearly, is like, I hate space. And the reason is because it's, when we're talking about waste, we're talking about the allocation of resources at the expense of something else. So it's always the case of what else you could do. So certainly a philosophy that, um, that I have in my projects is really focusing on this mid-scale, uh, these mid-scale endeavors where I think, uh, you know, there's, there's a lot of opportunity for creativity and a lot of opportunity to kind of, you know, not have a kind of what we call this sort of pork barrel projects where just a ton of money is wasted and not really well tracked, right? We always have to be responsible. I mean, I do think scientists, particularly scientists that are shepherding big projects, big missions, have to be ethically responsible about, okay, this mission has, has a goal and we're gonna be principled about how we use the funds, we're gonna be principled about how we're doing these things. Um, and of course, I mean, I think that this is, my personal view is that it's worthwhile doing this because as Peter said, this is our humanity, this is what, being a human in this universe is. Uh, but I think there's also pragmatic things, like from doing, from learning about GPR, G GR, you get things like, you know, GPS, and you get other pragmatic benefits from pushing the boundaries of what we know technologically and theoretically. And so there are actually pragmatic benefits that sort of come along uh, after the fact, but you can't conceive of those necessarily in advance. So we kind of just have an insurance policy that if we just, you know, if we just let humans kind of kind of push, you know, you know, push it, they're gonna come up with really great stuff and that great stuff is then gonna feed back in, into society. But I think the question of how much astronomy does a society need 
is a fair question. It's one that we have to be honest about as a community. It's a, it's, it's, we have to be principled mm -hmm. and, and understand that there's a limited, um, you know, limited pool of resources and we can't just build our space missions and build our telescopes at the expense of educating kids and, and, and we don't. you know. And that is and we don't, exactly right. yeah. where, where that knowledge is. is uh, it is so important as human species that we push the boundary, the frontier of the non known world, wherever it is, in whatever field it is. So uh, I have friends as well in the, in the room that are musicians. Uh, I, if you've ever heard contemporary music, um, some composers and experimenter in contemporary music, they, uh, they write not notes on a staff like we're used to read, but in very, very weird fashion. Sometimes you need a course just to read <laughs> the actual score. They're experimenting at the fringe of the known world of music today. And they're important. It's important. If you put all your resources in doing that, then that would be a chaotic world. But we don't. We actually put most of our resources in stuff that are important to every human being. Health, transportation, education. <coughs> Unfortunately, I would say war and defense. There's a lot of money there. A lot of creativity comes there and a lot of scientific advance also comes out of there. You never know where the new idea is going to come out unless you let people look at it, search, ask questions. And that small little fringe of folks that do that actually make us progress. Uh, what we would hope is that they would share in, in the science world it actually is not bad, the sharing of scientific knowledge. There are fields where uh, that sharing doesn't happen that well. Uh, and, and it's interesting that you mentioned yesterday that we diverted, uh, NASA diverted uh, uh, a small, really, really small moon of an asteroid. But it, it, up before that, it was science fiction. If one day there was an asteroid that would threaten the Earth, we'd know it a long time before it happens. But now we have the technology to probably do something about it. 500 years ago, we did not. So it does advance things, and there is concrete. But when again, when you speak about concrete stuff, they want results right away. But yet, they are very intrigued by we are at the set. What? There's a black hole at the center of our galaxy? That, I'm not quite sure what that means, but it, <laughs> it's still amazing <laughs> that we do have that. And uh, the society part we forget sometimes as, as technical oh, folks. No, I think you're absolutely right, because actually you're saying as technical folks. But what's striking me from listening to all three of you is we've got you know technical folks, science, operations, observations, what we do. And yet, the tenor of the entire conversation that you guys have had is about, if we're taking a look at society, where we are as a species right now on this planet and in the world, that what you're really all focusing on is narrative, messaging, oh, integration, like building community. Theory. Yeah. <laughs> well, whether that's musical or, or mathematical or verbal communication or education, which is fundamentally education, really the core of what you're hitting, I think, is this idea that if you can communicate in any and all, hopefully, of those ways, that ideas can be universally interesting to people, regardless. And yet we're living in a society where it seems like most of our challenges are actually coming because of a complete failure of integrative community building communication. Don't we hear that over and over again? You know, whether, whatever the modes of communication and media we have right now, we talk about the, the gaps. The fact that that communication isn't what you've all articulated so beautifully. So I think I'd, at this point I'd like to turn it over towards the, the, uh, the audience and begin to get some questions from folks there or aspects of this you either want to pick up oh, on man, or comment more. <laughs> um, Stella's got the microphone, so she's going to start working the room, uh, I guess, up in this way. We've got at least three up in the second row after this gentleman's had a chance to speak. I might even say I'm a scientist in aerospace and also a messianic and also an educator. And uh, Julie had the, the uh, 
privilege of looking at Earth uh, from there and try it one. Uh, we have been less fortunate. I, have tried, I live in four continents, so look at humanity from here. Uh, I think there are a few words that have been thrown here, humanity, 2060, you know, and, and um, knowledge and science. And I have a few troubling questions, you know, having lived over there. First of all, nature around us is nonlinear. If you look at human life, life and, and tree, and mountains, and rivers, they're all nonlinear. But the tools that we have developed over the last 2,400 years, um, scientific method, our great achievement based on Aristotelian uh, categories and, and uh, uh, logic and then empiricism, are all linear. You know, math is, are, are, are math is linear. Um, differential calculus is linear. Uh, linear algebra. Uh, general relativity theory is linear. Differential equations is linear. So the tools that we have developed are all linear. But not orbital yeah, mechanics. Well, I mean, uh, we approach nonlinearity through linearity. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, eighth, de eighth uh, uh, the order, uh, you know, answer calculus is still linear, right? It's linear. Um, now, uh, fortunately, at Massey College, I'm a Massey I, I, when I was here, there were two alternate ways of getting knowledge there too. Uh, Karen have produced two great uh, uh, thinkers in Marshall McLuhan and North of Fry here, right? Uh, and both were Neoplatonists. They were not Aristotelian. So they were a different way. And fortunately, um, other traditions like the Indics, uh, the Cynics, and the Abrahamics are all nonlinear, right? If you look at the symbols, they're nonlinear. You know? The thinking is nonlinear, not linear. So uh, uh, the trouble with, uh, you see, the linearity is that Marshall McLuhan and both, they alluded that linearity leads to violence. Now, without, they, uh, they said it without proof, okay? And all our town planning and building is linear. In fact, Massey, Massey College, I've, I've been told, is the most linear building on campus, okay? Uh, I mean, it happens to be, I'm saying, okay? Um, and, say, and therefore, I think that our science and I'm a scientist, it's really suicidal. I look at uh, what we have produced with science, uh, we have a, uh, have a way of living which is wasteful and produce global warming. And the way we live and use our resources and warm the globe, and there are floods uh, everywhere in the world because of our own lifestyle. And we, this is the lifestyle we are beginning to other people who they have not, they want to live like us, you know? So this is a wrong model, I think. And I, so this, this is a uh, second thing, it's violent, it's non-linear. And, uh, and third thing is that uh, if I think that if we continue to develop the science the way we are doing right now on a daily basis, we will not reach 2060. And they cannot do this without the cooperation of the other traditions, Platonic, Socratic, Abrahamic, Cynic, and Indian. And I don't see that because the politics is divisive. Aristotelian categories are divisive categories. So we divide the world into them and us and all that. So I would like to see that we have to think more about science itself, the nature of science, not what you do, if science is good or not. Because frankly speaking, being a scientist, I'm very disappointed in the way we're going. <laughs> Gretchen, and then I know um, Haley was here earlier. She had some comments on this linearity issue. So uh, maybe we'll get Gretchen and then over to Haley, because I know this was very similar to a conversation we were having earlier, and I'd love to get your perspective on that. Um, I have a million things I could say, but I'm going to keep it to one for now. Um, talking about, as you were talking, I kept thinking the fact that scientists are fundamentally curious people, and we're born with innate curiosity, and somewhere around our teenage years, it gets knocked out of most people for whatever reason. So scientists really are allowed to keep asking questions all their lives and are allowed to be perfectly happy if they get the wrong answer because the wrong answer often is the best answer. It tells you things that you didn't expect and that's where a lot of the doors open. But the average person doesn't ask questions, think in that way. And I think that one of the problems with the difference that we're talking about is that people don't, are allowed to be curious throughout their lives. It's as, a classroom as, management issue. <laughs> well, yes. Right? 
And, it gets, and that's the problem. That's right. That's the problem. You've got to have certainty in your life, and scientists don't care about certainty. They care about learning. Well, so you touch on two important points. One is this issue of what happens to the curiosity. Well, the curiosity is, I think, socialized out of us because, as I said, when you're in school, like you need people to behave. And I mean, even the scientific method, that's not actually how scientists do science. It's not like uh, we sit around and say, what is your hypothesis today? And uh, we will do a test. And now we will look at the, I mean, that, that, it, it is a more, you know, in practice, a much more nonlinear, a much more, you know, ideas are coming at you and you're trying to integrate these ideas. And then we put structure in place to organize and communicate that information the same way these books are not in a heap, they're organized so that we can access them in a, in a, in a, in a repeatable way. Um, I think, so, so I do think that scientists are the sort of lucky, I mean, I know this is true for myself, like I just didn't receive all the social messages. I mean, it was a huge pain in the neck for all of my teachers, my parents, every adult that ever had to deal with me, including Peter. Um, <laughs> it's just I'm just not good at receiving those messages. And, then, and, 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 and I think that a lot of people are much better <laughs> at receiving those messages, and they receive them well. Um, they've been evolved to receive social messages uh, uh, well. And you know, I think we have to ask ourselves what we want from our schools and what we want from our educational system. Do we want, you know, little boxes, uh, as Melvina Reynolds, uh, <laughs> you, you know, uh, warned about, or do we want, do we want, you know, creative, curious, chaotic kind of beings coming out? And I think that the times have changed to actually ask that question again. Um, uh, and then, you, you know, you asked about uh, curiosity, and then the second, the, you know, what happens, uh, what happens, and then the second part of your question was two things. I was talking about the average person doesn't understand what a scientist does. Well, right, I mean, we've given and this totally... They really trust scientists because they see them as, well, you ask a question, well, the scientist is, well, I'm pretty sure this, but I'm not totally Certainty. Confident. Yeah, so, so, the, so training kids about what uncertainty is instead of, you know, I think this is something that as a community scientists are not always good at because it is a hard, you know, it is a concept that we're comfortable in. We're very comfortable in uncertainty. We're very comfortable in, yeah, that may be right or they may be wrong, but that's not how, um, you know, uh, that doesn't provide the linear shells that people are looking for to organize their lives. And so we do actually have to help people with concepts of uncertainty. And this is part of scientific literacy and mathematical literacy. So people, I mean, people are integrating uncertain things constantly every second of the day. Like you can't get up out of bed, brush your teeth and have breakfast without doing a lot of probability and analysis, <laughs> okay? It's just happening under the hood and it's not being made manifest. But actually equipping people with the confidence and the knowledge that actually they are doing all of those things and this is just, a, we're, just we're just drawing out in a, in a, in a language, uh, you know, explicitly what's happening, I think is very important, right? Uh, and, and I do think that educating people, one of the things that is very, very difficult to, to teach is, is statistics and probabilities and uncertainty. That is something, I mean, it's even, it's difficult in quantum mechanics. I mean, it's the most annoying thing about quantum mechanics, yeah. right? It's <laughs> difficult in day-to-day -day life, and that, I think, is one of the places where, where uh, we don't teach it sufficiently because it, yeah. it rules the world. Uh, when someone comes to you and says, oh, I don't like taking the airplane because it's so dangerous. Well, it's a lot more dangerous to cross that street here called Hoskins, statistically. And they have this idea also that scientists, science is exact, yes. which it isn't. We, we, the, the, but and, but it, they, they find very hard the idea that, oh my God, we're 99.999% sure that we reproduce the boson, the Higgs boson. Well, I'm not sure at 100%, well, because <laughs> there's some uncertainty there. But in our books, 99.999 is certain, right? It's, uh, it's if, you, if you go on board a space shuttle and you're in the later missions and we had five space shuttle and there's three left, two 
had accidents that killed people, then your probability of getting to space is just a little bit above 50%. Uh, should you go, should you not go? I mean, statistics is everywhere. If, you, if, if that is not taught in, in a way where we're comfortable with this, it is, it, we make decisions about statistics all the time. All the time, you know. Uh, well, if I, if I take five more minutes in my bed now, what are the probabilities that I will make the bus to get to school? I mean, it's, now it's a lot easier than it was within my time, because <laughs> I'm old. Uh, it was not that easy, because we didn't know when the bus was coming. So it was just a probability. <laughs> will I catch it, not catch it? Well, it's, it's, uh, it's something that I think is, is something that we need to get comfortable with, because then we would be a lot more comfortable with the news of, of what's happening. Um, and, that, uh, and that it's not alarmist, it's, it's the fact, evidence. And now everybody could look at the evidence and say, okay, mm, yes. Uh, yeah, the evidence says that, and, that, and I believe that. that. I want to get, get ready, then I will shut up. No, 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 no it's okay. Don't, I just want to get a couple yeah. people more Something in before like the end. climate change. Yes. People are terrified and worried about climate change. Scientists are worried too, but scientists are used to dealing with uncertain situations and dealing with plans to, to work on the problem. So let them do it. Yes, they'll find a solution. Well, I think what's interesting well. there, though, is, is we do talk about this sort of very fairy concept of uncertainty, but really what it is is risk analysis. And if you can translate that in the way that operationally, sometimes you can have another avenue into a conversation with somebody that they're going to understand it from a risk analysis point of view, right. uh, if you can't from uncertainty. But just to pop on over to Haley there, because um, Haley is a, a, res a researcher and, and professor at uh, York University, and just from our chat earlier, you were talking about science in a way that was very non-linear. And so I think that might be neat to hear that perspective, if you don't mind me putting you on the spot. No, thank you very much. Um, no, I'm really enjoying the discussion, and, and thank you very much for Can all you of your perspectives. You stand up, maybe. Maybe you stand up and project as if you're in front of your classroom, <laughs> Haley. Thank you. Um, no, no, thank you very much. I'm really enjoying all the different perspectives. I just wanted to, to kind of get back to this idea of fighting against the second law of thermodynamics and how we are striving for order. And it reminds you of the quote by Henry Adams, um, order is the dream of man, chaos is the law of nature. Oh. And <laughs> as scientists, we like to put things into discrete boxes that have nice theoretical framework boundaries with well-described, defined parameters. Um, and in doing so, we often lose the emergent structure. And so how do we use these Galileo moments, these discrete windows of unprecedented opportunity to gain knowledge to probe the emergent structure of the phenomena that we're looking at? Um, and in my work, I often think about this in the definition of life. And as we grapple with the definition of life in reducing life to its, some of its parts, are we really losing sight of the emergent phenomena that makes life life? How do we reconcile um, that tendency with emergent phenomena? That's, a, that's an awesome question. I love this question because I think that it's an example of how we can, as humans, hold different ideas in our heads at the same time. So we can actually look for that order, look for those rails, while at the same time thinking, oh, they might not actually, at root reality, it might not be there, but okay, let's just... So I just view this as tools in our toolkit and, and, and not... Um, those rails have been very successful for allowing us to make predictions in different, in different areas. I think that in areas like neuroscience and areas like biology, and you know, I mean, I think Peter, you taught me uh, chemistry is hard physics, biology is hard chemistry, and neuroscience is <laughs> hard biology. Um, we're not at the point where we have identified those rails yet, right? But, we're, but again, as I said earlier, I think we're kind of at an early stage in some of these areas where we're, we're probing them. But I, I think the whole concept that some things may just be emergent and might not have a rail um, is, is one that we have, to, we have to hold close as a possibility. And mm -hmm. again, it gets to this uncertainty. Being able to hold a few different things in our minds as possibilities without needing to you know, collapse the wave function and feel better about it. And that's kind of the role of the, you know, I think of the scientific citizen, if we can coin that kind of term, is to actually just deal with that belly churning, um, 
uncertainty that may be that that may be it, um, and 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 still find find the joy where we can find those rails and where we can. I mean, we can make predictions. I mean, you don't put someone in a rocket and just say good luck, <laughs> <laughs> right? I mean, it's incredible. Oh right? yeah, yeah. <laughs> Uh, I think or raise, just, just, yeah. to, just to add, or raise, you know, do that from, from that side of the science folks, you know, the technical folks, I call them, and then, and then raise the, 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 the appetite everywhere else to, to look at facts and to make their own decisions. Uh, I, people call it science culture. I don't know what it is, the right term, uh, but it's about everyone has the capacity ability to figure out things. Uh, I, uh, you talk about thermodynamics, I'm not so sure I remember the second law of thermodynamics, <laughs> but I do know that if I put too much spaghetti sauce into the mason jar and I put it in the freezer, it will explode. <laughs> and that is thermodynamics. So it doesn't matter what level, my level in, in so many fields, including plastic arts and, and everything, is so bad. But I, you know, it's good to have a bit of everything to, to, and this is where I think that people feel that science is not for themselves, when it is, yeah. because it's part of our lives. And so how do you connect that back? You know, how many yeah. people here are from a scientific background? We see that's very Every reassuring. one of you should have your hands raised. Every one of you as a human no, is from no, a scientific from, background. No, in a way I feel much better. I was afraid that all of the, except for you, Andras. <laughs> Andras is trumpetist. And uh, he, that everybody would have put their hands up. This is exactly what these kinds of forums are for, as to bring this. And, and ideas are probably even better in this room than certainly I could come up. But how do we return <laughs> your inalienable right to science that many of you who didn't raise your hands have lost? Because we established that in the playground you were all scientists. So what happened? Right? We had two more questions over here and then we're probably going to have to, we have another hour of free form discussion oh in the next room with some libation. Um, so don't let this stop, but uh, for the formal uh, part of the proceedings, I think there were two hands raised over here, and I want to make sure I give them an opportunity. Um, get everybody in for a first question first. Maybe I, people have second questions, I'll refer you to the social hour. Yeah, go ahead. Hi. Uh, so thanks a lot. This is a really cool panel. Um, so I'm Patrick. I'm a junior fellow, and I'm a philosopher of physics. And one thing earlier on in the discussion that came up was like kind of the idea of trying to want to bring everyone together on the same page, right? You want your astronomer to be able to talk to the astrologer, even if you don't necessarily give the same credence to the claims that are made by everyone, you want everyone to be able to talk to one another and kind of coexist and work together towards common goals. Um, but for that to be possible, there have to be kind of rules of the game that establish how people can kind of, like how they're allowed to talk to one another, how they're able to kind of achieve some sort of common ground. Uh, and I wanted to kind of contrast that against the historical example that we've been using throughout of Galileo, because, of course, one of the other amazing things about Galileo is that he was a breaker of rules. And that's kind of also constitutive of what was impressive about what he did, is that there were these well-established rules that the, you know, the scientific community of the time had in place, and he broke a lot of them. And it was because he broke a lot of those rules uh, that he was able to make this kind of progress. So I'd be interested in hearing your perspectives on, like, how... How can we simultaneously uphold the, the idea that we need these rules to bring everyone together, but also that these Galileo moments really require a breaking of rules? I personally don't think they're incompatible, but... I don't think they're incompatible either. Oh. I mean, you just got to know which rules to break. <laughs> and, <laughs> when, and when. And when. And space flight is a good example for that, uh, because there are cer certain rules you don't break. When there's a hydrogen leak, you get worried uh, immediately. <laughs> Um, because that, and I'm not a chemist, Peter, but uh, I know that uh, it wants a friend, and when it gets to a friend, it does pow. So that's how much I know about hydrogen. But there are a number of times when something happens and you are not so sure what to do. Uh, you are relying, though, and this is where the forte of what I call education, and education can be so broad a term, is useful, is you dig into it, 
in order to find a solution to a problem you didn't have before and you had never seen in your classroom or at home or with your parents. So that's why I, th I think what you're asking is not incompatible. But mm -hmm. Peter. Well, th there's another way that we break rules. There are rules of nature that we can violate by, say, releasing some chemical into the atmosphere that we shouldn't have. Then we get an ozone hole or something like that. And I think of things like that. It, uh, it, I don't think it's automatically guaranteed that when we do those oops kind of things uh, that we would learn about it. Maybe. But anyway, we, ha we have the ability to measure something called the ozone hole and then to correct it. So, so that was a good thing. And the Montreal Protocol and so on was a good example of uh, an international effort to get something that was globally important uh, under control. Uh, climate change and the CO2 is, is not insurmountable, but, it, but it's, a, it's a kind of an oops thing, right? We're violating nature uh, the natural uh, atmosphere of the earth and, and everything that depends on it uh, by what we're doing. But we can, uh, we can correct it. The easiest way to correct it is not to shoot, you know, burn more fossil fuels uh, rather than just you know, trying to fix up the disaster afterwards. Uh, I kind of liked uh, what you said about the asteroid pushing it away away so it misses the earth. I'm the type of person that is cynical enough to think that if we can push it away to miss the earth, we could push one so it would hit the earth. And maybe that's preposterous, but you know, there's other examples in history of technology that uh, is supposed to be beneficial and so on that just turned against us. So we always have to be uh, uh, aware of something like that. Uh, so that's uh, that's the that's my uh, little intervention on rules. rules what I love about are, both of you is you both said ask more questions. Yeah. I love that we're ending with a philosophical question, and I'm going to give the final word to Juna as our speaker. No, we've oh, uh, we've had quite a few. I, I, if, I'm, if you don't mind, I'm only going with one question for everybody and, because we have another hour. So I would very much welcome your second question over libations next door. But right now, I will uh, just let Juna. Well, so I myself have the final am word. a rule breaker, so I'm very sympathetic to the breaking of rules. But there are some rules that I think are inviolate, and those rules are um, I respect my fellow human at all times and at all costs. I think that that is, uh, there are some rules that we have to agree on uh, and I think Galileo also uh, followed that rule. And I think there are, um, you know, I think we shouldn't put so many rules in place that we're in a kind of straitjacket of our own making. We have to actually allow for people to be creative and we have to give people grace and space for that. Um, but we have to, really just at root, uh, the big rule that everyone is breaking right now, just completely and totally without uh, uh, caution, is the respect for one another as a fellow human being. And I think that's a rule that we all can get behind. Okay, then the great thing is, first, I think we've started where we, finished where we started, because there's two things that Gus got articulated here, which is respect for other people and ask a different question were two words that anybody who knew Ursula meant knew, that she embodied those and yeah. said them explicitly, yeah. constantly. So we continue to embody her inspiration. I want to thank our panelists for all of you really, really staying true to that tradition of, of, uh, of pushing the envelopes of thinking. Um, and to remind everybody here that this is just the beginning of a conversation, because the nice thing is these are all Massey senior fellows. Um, both uh, Peter and Juna live here in the city, and Julie this year is a uh, senior fellow in residence here at the University of Toronto. Not all the time, but she's here very often, and you can find her over in Office 3-1 if you're looking for her and you want to continue the conversations there. Mm -hmm. um, certainly for the next hour, we have 
lots of libations. I'm looking forward to hearing your second question, <laughs> sir. Thank you. I really, these things mean nothing if it isn't for the interaction of the audience. So I really want to thank you all for coming, for your time, for your enthusiasm and questions. And let's keep it rolling next door over the next hour. Thank you. Thank you, Barbara. Thank you, Barbara.